Good afternoon, everyone. Everybody on the East Coast, it's an afternoon. West Coast, good morning. Thank you all for joining us today on Saturday. Um, but this is a really exciting leadership training session, and I'm so excited to be here with you guys. So first off, we are excited to welcome Brenda Fannin from the HEAL Collaborative. Um, Brenda, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited about this presentation. Um, and I hope you all listening will learn a lot during this. So thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you so much, Mended Hearts. I'm so excited to be with you all today. Uh, I have to admit, this is gonna be, um, the, the, doing this in this format is gonna be my first time, so bear with me. I'm typically very used to getting feedback uh, from an audience, so that helps me to kind of switch from topic to topic, but this is okay, I'm ready for it. I just have one thing to tell you before I begin. Uh, I have a co-host today, and uh, hopefully you won't see him too much, but, you may hear him snoring in the background. And this is Nico, this is my little dog. So while people have kids in the background, etc., this is Nico and he sits right next to me during my Zoom calls while I am on all day. I have a little place for him to sit. But the, big, the funny thing about it is he's a snorer. So if you hear something snoring in the background, that's just Nico. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started now. I can't, oh, yes, I do see my slides. Okay, uh, like I said, this is, okay, so um, basically this is a, a Nigerian proverb and you can read it for yourself, but this just goes to show and to remind us that history is usually, is, is typically written by the victors. So, um, and I think that, I didn't make that up, that's Winston Churchill and uh, what's important to know about that is that um, we don't always know, records have not always been taken of what our true history has been as an American people. So, next slide. Okay, so what's your story? So 2020 has brought about a whole lot of interesting conversations for a whole lot of us, especially those of us who are really passionate about uh, social issues. And um, what I have found is that this is a time when people are really enjoying getting together and look in little groups, smaller venues to try to push the needle a little bit further on what they're really feeling about diversity and race in this country. These are hard times. No one knows the answer. Uh, the, the good news is that no one knows the answer. Black people don't know how to solve this. White people don't know how to solve this. No one really knows how to solve this problem that all of us have that we didn't create, okay? So we all know that for sure. There have been a lot of scholars uh, that have come up, that bubbled up from say, even January, it till now, where scholars are addressing race and talking about race in different terms. So my presentation part today is to really sh walk you through some concepts that you may know or that you may not know. Um, it's to remind you of a little bit of our African-American Black history, just a little. And at the end of the conversation, if you have felt some type of stirring in your heart about anything that I am reminding you of or sharing with you, then that's the place where you need to go and write it down and go back and figure out why did this part of this story or why did this part of this conversation impact me in any way? That's the place where you're gonna have to go back and, and, and examine. I've had to do it myself. Every black person in America has had to re-examine themselves. All of us are being called 
all of us are being called to a higher level of conscious, all of us. No one gets left behind in solving this story, in solving this problem, I should say. So let's get started. My story, this is my grandfather. And uh, my grandfather was a fifth generation farmer. He farmed until the day he died at the age of 91. He died of a heart attack after wearing a pacemaker for 20 years. So he was a heart patient story, success story. No one questioned his race because of course he was five generations um, of his family had lived in the same place that he had lived in. So everyone knew who, exactly who he was, but he was a black man. When he was a young man just starting out, oh, no, sorry, go back. <laughs> when my grandfather was uh, uh, just starting out, um, starting his family, he was told he should leave altogether and go to um, leave West Tennessee altogether because it was a time when the Ku Klux Klan was rioting, mobbing, and stealing and terrorizing the black community. But my grandfather decided to stay right where he was. He wouldn't leave. He did not leave his home. My grandfather, in essence, chose to be black because if he had moved from the South to the North, which is what many people did, um, he could have chosen to continue with the black heritage, but what a lot of people were doing at that, that point in time was basically um, they were becoming white. Uh, when they left their homes in the South and moved North. So the, our families are rich in culture. All of our families are. So what made my grandfather black? What made his race black? Well, um, in this country, there's a thing called the one drop rule. And that rule basically states that if you are, if you have one drop of African American blood in you, that means you're black. One single drop. And what the forefathers did was really, really smart. This was a legal definition that they put into place, the one drop rule. It's completely legal. And Thomas Jefferson was one of the biggest benefactors of this law. Thomas Jefferson, who was very wealthy and who was also openly very much in love with his black slave, Sally Hemings, did not want to leave anything to their five black children. So in order to preclude children of mixed race from inheriting land and money, there was this one drop rule that was in place to preclude blacks from accumulating wealth due to their birthright. Next slide. This is my mom and dad. And unfortunately, I lost both of my mom and dad, both my mom and dad to complications due to multiple strokes. As you can see, I have had a lot of hard heart issues in my life. I have many families who have pacemakers and um, I just wish I had known mended hearts existed at the time, at least when I was uh, shepherding my mom and my dad through their process. But this is them on their wedding day in New York City, which is where I was born. Both of them migrated from the north to the south, which is what many of them did, hoping for more fair opportunities. And the car trips that we would take from, say, New York City to the south or from the south and back were very, very interesting because the police would stop people during those days. And I am old enough to remember this when we would travel, especially going through hard places like Virginia. I remember Virginia, Roanoke, those used to be some really tough places. But we'd travel um, from 
uh, New York to the south. And of course, the men would be in the front and the, the, the women and kids in the back. And police were known to stop people if there was a black man sitting in the front with white looking children and wives in the back. So in order to avoid any of this controversy, now we're all one family, but to the public, it looked completely different. So to avoid this, I remember those painful trips. We have, we'd have to get up at 12 at midnight and drive all night so that we could drive while it was dark, while we were going through several towns. And of course, it was my, always my mother who would have to go into the hotel and get the hotel room as the rest of us would have to go into the back of the hotel and sneak in because hotels at that point in time were not taking all black people. So this is in my day and age. This is not old stuff. What has happened is I think that I'm, Oh, I think, am I supposed to read that text? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think that, um, I'm sorry, I get distracted, so I have ADD. Um, I think that what I'm trying to say, if you can take anything away from those stories is, a lot of the pain that you see with Black people today is, it is pain. It's not, it, it may manifest itself in anger, but it's pain. And if you have not found a way to work through that pain, it comes out looking crazy like it has. Um, but let's keep going. And I have to do a time check, hold on. Oh, I'm good on that. Okay, but I, and I am gonna save room for questions at the end. So let's get into the next slide. What is risk? Okay, so we learned a few things about what race is from the story that I just told. <clears throat> race puts people in our society in different categories based on the way you look, based on your skin color, your hair color, your hair texture, curly or straight. But what happened in that personal story that I shared with you? Well had a grandfather with very straight hair and based upon this one drop rule, he was still black. Do you see how convoluted this whole thing has gotten? But race is a legal identifier. As I mentioned, there's the one drop rule, which basically legally tells you, and is still in existence today, that if you have one drop of African blood in you, you are black in this country. <clears throat> Race is an arbitrary social category assigned by the United States. It has nothing to do with your biology or your genealogy. There's no medical test, at least that I'm aware of, that can determine whether someone is black or white. Race is fluid. It can change, as it did with my uh, relatives who were black in the South and became white in the North. As it can, as we continue to define uh, what racial categories we have according to the census. So that's what race is. But when you think further, what is racism? Racism is a is the imposition of a bigoted idea on a group of people. Racism is prejudice plus power. So you can't be a racist unless there's a power factor there. And in order, so basically consider that whenever you're talking about racism. That means that one specific group or person is doing something racist and they have power over that person. Well before enslaving black men, white people have used things like money, politics, and terrorism 
to consolidate their power and protect their comfort at the expense of black people. The 2020 fight against racism though, is less about racist people or racist individuals. The 2020 fight that we're fighting is about racist institutions, established institutions that are racist. For example, the system of police brutality against black people, the system of voter suppression by way of poor access to the ballot box, the system of unfair wages and access to housing and lending, the system of unaffordable health care in the Black community, the system of the lack of access to healthy foods in our neighborhood, the system of whiteness. Next slide. So what is whiteness? Or rather, what is, what is white culture? Well, I can tell you I know white culture very well. I've spent my entire academic and professional life inside of white culture. Maybe you all have too. Whiteness is the unquestioned standard of behavior. That's what it is. That's all it is. It's called, it's whiteness. The unquestioned standard of behavior. And the thing about whiteness is it's very hard to see because it has become so normalized and so embedded in what we have labeled as professional, effective, or even good. The fact that it's hard to see is the reason why it has become so powerful. We can't see it. It's so ingrained in who we are. But the legendary civil rights activist, uh, Ruby Sales, quoted that the culture of whiteness is a dehumanating process that melts away all of our multiple and interlocking identifiers, such as race, clash, class, gender, and sexualities, so that unity is maintained for power. So what does whiteness look like in our organizations? What does it look like? It looks like hiring practices because of fit. It's locating big infrastructure of operations into white communities. It's the unwritten rules of expectation based upon grooming and dress, dress based upon European standards. It's the checking of the box by hiring a diversity lead or by doing diversity training that has never worked and never will. And I'll talk about how we need to have more meaningful conversations and dialogue that's the only thing that's going to move this needle is understanding our stories, knowing who we are, and understanding our struggle. Rather than ask how do white organizations attract, hire, and retain black people, the question should really be, why does so much power and organizational authority remain in white hands? But more importantly, I hope that each person will examine themselves by starting with one question. When you're talking about race or hearing things and conversation or you read things about race, Pay attention to the little resistance that may come up in you. Resistance comes up in me all the time. Did this presentation cause you any little bit of resistance? And I can give you examples of that maybe when we open it up. But start there. Start 
Start paying attention to the resistance you feel right here. Change yourself. Change your community. Change your business. Start with you, that feeling of resistance. Start right there. And that's all I have for today. Uh, if you want, we can open it up for questions or I don't know how we're doing this. I think you mentioned I should be looking maybe at yep. the chat. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, well, um, Jody or Mandy or I, we can read the questions if you want us to read and moderate them for you. That way you don't have to look at both things. Um, so if anybody uh, has questions, uh, please type them into the chat box and Jody can read them out and uh, we can maybe have a conversation. Yeah, Bruce um, Park said, um, a great book that supports your talk is Castle, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. Brenda, yes. Brenda Fannin is giving an outstanding talk, very timely in our country. I agree with that 100%, Bruce. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Linda Mason said, powerful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, one of the questions that I had come up on um, text is, what are some of the things we can do as an organization to allow for more um, diversity and differences uh, with race and uh, other types of diversity in our organization? Right, um, and that's a question I get all the time. It's, um, and it's really hard to answer in a, the answer to that question today has to go deeper than it did before, because I know you've been probably asking this question since you've been in existence. So there's absolutely no way I'm going to sit here and say, I have a toolkit and these are the things you must do because all the things that were done before are not working. But right. here's what I, here's the general area that I would look in. Um, the general area that I would start with is trying to determine, and most people probably already know, why is so much power within the, the race category of white. Why, why has that been allowed to persist as long as it has? Um, because when I'm talking to people, I, I really don't like it when they say things like, um, well, nobody really likes us and we just haven't been able to do it. That's, you, you, you have to sort of start from the top. And you have to ask yourself why. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a good question because we, one of our goals, one of our six goals for the year is to, to increase diversity. Um, our organization, I don't know if you've looked at our demographics, but it's very white. And, um, and so we want to really be inclusive and accepting. Yeah. And it, it has been a struggle to figure out how to do that in a way that honors everyone. Like everyone has their validity and their place in mended arts and mended little arts, no matter what race, culture, lifestyle, age, you know, education, socioeconomic. And so um, it's been something we've really looked at. I, um, Jen asked, um, in your experience, when you're, you've delivered presentations in person, what has been your observations of when people become uncomfortable with talking about race and how can we as leaders facilitate that when we are reaching out to membership and providing them educational topics? Good question, Jen. Okay, so was, was that sort of a two-part question? I think it was a two-part question. So your observation, like kind of what do you do when it gets uncomfortable and, yes. and how do you facilitate that? And then how can we, um, you know, educate people more yeah. on these topics when we're not, some of us aren't really qualified to, you know, discuss these topics well, right? Right, well, well, okay, so let me, let me take, okay, so I don't feel like I completely answered the first question, and let me wrap that, that answer around with the last part and then deal with the, the middle part. So, um, what I'm doing is I am developing, um, or have developed for my clients already, small chunks because everyone's heart is in the right place. So there are small strategy sessions that 
um, I've established and that we can talk about after this call, how we can basically set something like that up because we de definitely, I have access to and I can find you people if I can't do it myself, um, can absolutely help you with having these conversations. And there are ways to do it. I wouldn't actually probably do it, but I definitely like to be able to sit with you and maybe strategize on a few things after this. And again, I'm very resistant to giving you pat answers. I mean, we- yeah. I appreciate that. I um, I am in charge of that goal as the staff person in charge of it. I ha I do have a background in doing training, corporate training in this issue, um, even though, you know, I'm a white girl. But um, I do have some exercises with active listening, reflective listening, and, and things like that, um, so we can be heard and hear each other. So I would love to talk to you. After yes, that. absolutely. I'm, I'm, this is my passion. So I would definitely, definitely um, talk to you but, um, about that. One of the things, though, that you always have to remind people of, which I try to do at the beginning of these dialogues, is you're going to have to tell people, this is not easy stuff. This is not, you know, you, you sit and your stomach feels good throughout it. But yes. part of the healing and the pain is going to help solve the, the, yes. the real problem. So, and of course, as you were mentioning, leadership that shows up, leadership who are able to share their stories. I mean, it's amazing the stories. And I can share you story, share with you tons and tons of other stories. But sharing the stories is, is the really big part. Um, I, wait, there was another question. I don't think I got to it. And I think it was, I think you did answer it, like what you do when people are uncomfortable and then the um, educational piece of it. So I think you did answer okay. it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. And then um, Nadine, if you, if anyone who has their hand raised could type in the chat box, because we have a bunch of questions um, coming in the chat box and I, they came first. So I want to make sure we get to them. Yeah. Um, we also Kate? have a couple questions, Jody, in the question box, the Q&A from oh, Bob. Okay, I see what you're saying. I, yeah. There's one with Kay that came in before anything came in Q&A, so I'll read okay. that, and Mandy, you read the question next, okay? Sounds we'll good. take turns. Um, Kay says, do you think there is similar discrimination with male, female, and power and subservience? Ah, okay. So... Oh, okay, so do I think that there are, there's similar experience with male, female? So, of course, we are all in a male-dominated world, right? I mean, all of us are. So I don't know if the question was geared toward Black males. This is what's really hard about this. I think child. it was this male, female in general. I think the question is, is it a similar type of i mean is i guess the question may be broader than that like is all discrimination equal maybe that kind of thing like male female discrimination versus racial discrimination so i don't know if you can address that i probably can because i've been all okay so are you asking me are are black males more discriminated against yes is that the question i don't think so i think oh, okay. it's just are women discriminated against similar yes. to how people are discriminated against by race? Ah, okay. So, black, okay, so all women are, yes, discriminated against. All women are discriminated against. It's, it, it, however, if there's typically a black woman is more Typically, now I try to stay away, away from racial stereotypes, which is a reason why, the reason why I don't like to solution on calls like this, because um, typically you're, you're, a black woman is, there's more race, um, I'm sorry, a, a black woman is more discriminated against. I still don't know that I answered that question. It's, it's okay. I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on because we're starting to get a lot of questions. So Mandy, do you want to ask the next one? Yeah. Bob asks, um, can Amended Hearts Chapter, how can Amended Hearts Chapter group reach out to the African American community? And then the second piece is, uh, can the chapter group invite you as a guest speaker to help with diversity? Okay. So, um, okay. So, 
The last question is easiest. Of course, you can invite me to come and speak as a, as a guest speaker. Absolutely. Now, how can you reach out to the Black community? I, I, again, I'm going to try really hard not to solution, but, but I know you all want answers. So I have to assume, because I sat back and thought about this, I have to assume that Mended Hearts um, has all, already knows things like um, you need to make sure that you call into the person's house if you're volunteering, call them first, make sure you develop some form of a rapport. Uh, so I, I have to go through your process steps before I can really sit down and say how you can reach out. Do you see why that's necessary? Yes, I do. Okay. For okay. sure. Okay. Yeah, we probably need um, work to well, right. get. And, yeah. and, and like I said, I am happy to do it. But again, what I'm not going to do is sit here and shoot out a bunch of stuff that you'll be like, well, I tried that. I tried that. I tried that. So right. I do know that there are ways to improve. Here's what I do now. I know that there are ways to improve. And I know I can help you with those things. So, yeah, yeah. you know, there you go. And, and the fact that you all are willing, I mean, we've solved the problem right there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, another question that came in is said, um, we, in, we traditionally increase our membership by reaching out to individuals who are looking for cardiac support. This is done in person over the phone initially. With the pandemic, we are moving to virtual support by providing iPads in the hospital. Do you see that as helpful with um, increasing diversified membership or um, a hint or not, I guess? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm assuming if they are connecting with mended hearts that there probably is some type of condition in the home that precludes them from being able to um, well, the precludes them from having maybe access to a whole lot of other simple things. So I'm going to just leap right out there and say that more technology, unless, you know, yeah, an iPad, sure. Every, typically, everyone knows how to use an iPad. And I would assume that most of your patients are, you know, somewhere maybe, you know, who know, well, they're young. That's right. I forgot you all have so, so many young patients. So you have the span, but if, you know, you have, here's the question you have to ask yourself. Does this person have access to something more than a phone that they know how to use? That's the question. Yeah. So we're put, we're actually giving the hospitals free iPads so they can connect with us. And, um, they don't have to have the device themselves. So we're putting them in any hospital who will receive one and the, they can go from patient to patient. It's in a sanitary case. That way, if someone doesn't have a device, they can still connect with us. Um, oh, that's nice. Yes. <laughs> that yes, is, is. what I mean. Whoever that idea. <laughs> Well, I think um, our our VP Liz Blumenfeld and Andrea, and then we we started exploring it, and um, a lot of people brought those ideas to the forefront, and uh, we decided, yeah, this is something we want to do, and we started asking the questions, and next thing we knew, we got a donation of 500 iPads from AstraZeneca. Oh my God! Right. <laughs> It's really cool. It's really cool. So anyway, Mandy, I think you have a question in the question box. Yeah, Bruce Parks wondered, how does privilege fit into the subject of your talk? Very, question. very good question. So um, I'm a product of privilege. I'll re leap out there and say, I think I know where Bruce was coming from. But, but um, it, all of us who have been submersed uh, or who have benefited from white culture have benefited from privilege. Um, naturally, in any society where you have a better start, um, for example, I was born, my grandfather owned 
land. My family still has a lot of land. There was an expectation in me that by the time I got to my generation that I was expected to not only get an undergraduate degree, but to get a graduate degree. I was expected to know and understand white culture as well as white people, and I was fully immersed into it. My mother made sure that I uh, signed up for every ballet class. I played the piano. Um, we, we wrote poetry. So privilege is not just white privilege. Privilege is privilege. So naturally, when you are in a more privileged situation, you're going to fare better. It, it just it, it's just that way. But what we say as far as black people and privilege, it's easier when you're white or are in the white race category to um, really benefit from privilege because you don't have the look of a brown person. And as we went back to say, race is based upon looks. So I don't know if th that question about privilege is such a big topic. Again, I'm not sure if I got directly to your topic, but it, privilege definitely does play into it. Yeah, yeah. And I think in a similar um, question, uh, Linda asked, would you elaborate on the common feelings of resistance that you alluded to? Yes. Okay. So, um, while I, when I am typically doing these conversations, um, one thing that may come up uh, as I'm talking about, say for example, not having access to good healthy foods. Um, and and I'm, I, I understand, let me just park the fact that, um, well, okay, I'm sorry. I, I think my brain thought was thinking faster than my mouth. Let, let me say it like this. So um, many people are struggling because they don't have healthy foods in their community. They could be black or they, or they could be white. So when we talk about, um, oh, wait a minute, did, am I answering the right question? <laughs> I think there's like some of the... Uh-oh. Yeah. I think we lost Jody. That's okay. Let me ask a question while we're trying to get her back. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. So I would like to know from a personal perspective, when you start having conversations and you do feel that very uncomfortable. Um, yes, resistance. Inside and that pit like, oh, I really don't want to be talking about this or you automatically think, I don't believe that. That's not how I feel. What do you do then? Like, what's the next step from there? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What's the, okay. So where you are resistant is usually the place where you have to go back and do a little bit more research. Um, do I have time to tell you about my friend Tanya and her resistance? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So Tanya is a really good friend of mine. She's one of my best friends. She's my neighbor. Tanya, um, Tanya and I have had some of the hardest conversations. Tanya's a white woman. And, and by the way, just an aside, um, and this is what gets me in trouble is my aside conversations. <laughs> so let me just write down, I'm going to tell you about Tanya. I, in my life, has, have made conscious decisions to make sure that my circle is full of, of rich culture. I have Asian friends, Indian friends, white friends, black friends. I have friends, I have all types of friends. And it's not something that is really naturally something that we would necessarily think to do. It's something that we have to work on. And I say that because it's very easy to sit in our little fiefdoms and kind of go where our family has been maybe, or go where you know your friends may be navigating. But um, what's really important is we have to make these conscious efforts to understand each other a little bit better. So Tanya's white, 
And Tanya has been so upset, as most people have, about all of the riots that have been going on. And I was trying to explain to Tanya uh, that, you know, Black people are hurting. We're mad. We're frustrated. And we know riots are wrong. And no, we don't want people rioting. And it's the absolutely most craziest thing to do is get out there and uh, steal from people who have nothing to do with the issue. But we're mad. And so Tanya said to me, she said, um, well, you know, I understand black people. I was poor too. I don't know if any of you all stopped and heard that like I did because my resistance came up. I was like, whoa, Tanya. <laughs> Are you saying you can relate to a black person because black people are poor? What are you trying to say here? And so we got into a really hard discussion. It ended up because I was so angry. I, I went completely off on her. And so with the resistance that comes up, thank God I was able to kind of get it out in my safe space because I knew after it was all said and done, after I called her a racist and she went home, after she came back and knocked on my door crying, telling me she wasn't a racist, I knew we were gonna still be friends. I wasn't gonna lose a friendship over that. And you just don't. So, by resistance, I mean, pay attention to those things that bubble up. I didn't like the fact that Tanya thought all black people were poor. What, what century are you living in? <laughs> so that's kind of an example of what I mean by follow your, find out more about your resistance. So in that case, I was able to go and talk to Tanya and get that off my chest. Tanya is becoming, and I'm becoming as well too when it comes to this topic. And I'm trying to understand my positions of resistance. I think one of the things that happened with the Tanya conversation, quite frankly, could have been, I was sad that she didn't know more. That's what it was. That Tanya is someone who I, like I said, she's my neighbor. We worship together. We go to church together. I was sad that she did not know more about me. Thank you. Andy, do you have any other questions in the chat box? Not specifically for this. A lot of people really want your contact information, Brenda, and I understand that it's on the last slide. Um, yes. yes. So yes. we'll have that. Uh, and right. Oh, Joseph, we do have a few. Do we have another five minutes, Andrea, for one more question? Yes, I think so. So, well, Jody wanted to know what HEAL stands for. Um, oh, what does yes. the acronym stand for? Um, yeah, and then Joseph had one more question. I don't know if we have time for it, Andrea. Let me know later. Okay. Yeah, I think so. We we should have we have like five minutes, so we're okay. Ready. So that's the first question, Brenda. What does Heal stand for? And then Joseph asks, Are you familiar with Thrive Summit, Ray Johnson interviews, um, TD, T, TD Jakes, Pastor Jakes? Um, are you familiar with any of those? No. I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't really follow necessarily T.D. Jakes, but I, I love T.D. Jakes and I've read four of his books. Um, I have heard of Thrive, Thrive and I don't know why though. So, okay. Yeah. Maybe he, yeah. Thank you. But yeah, I'm going to look them up. Obviously it's something good and I'm going to, I wrote those down. I'm trying to look up the acronym for HEAL for you because I don't want to <laughs> get that wrong. <laughs> Let me try to find that really quick. Uh, we live in an acronym world, don't we? We really, really do. And the problem is he'll just change their branding. And I noticed on one of their, uh, their some of their branding information, they didn't quite spell it all right. I may have to send that to you. Okay. Okay. I think it was just more. It's like that. education advocacy. I don't remember the H. It's education, advocacy. Oh, I know, health, education, advocacy, and legislature. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, because those are all the, the aspects HEAL is attacking. I love HEAL, by the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
So um, I know we'll, we'll finish up and we have, you have some resources here um, on the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of them I've already written down for books to put in my long list of books I want to read. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And um, I will just leave you a couple of minutes to say anything you'd like to say in closing. I just want to say you guys have been great. Um, I've really, really enjoyed you all. I can tell you all are a great group of people. Um, I've worked a lot of different places in a lot of different cultures all around the world. And I will tell you that people are people wherever you go. And most people want to get it right. Nobody wants to show up and hate anybody. And people want to want to do it, do well in this space. And I get that. So if there's anything I can do, you have my contact information. Please, by all means, shoot me an email. I'd love to keep in touch with you on Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm not as great as it is I should be, but I'd love to do that by keeping in touch with you. And if you are ever in need of uh, a discuss to want to talk to somebody from a personal level about some of the things you're struggling with. That's I, I love those conversations. So um, I'm opening myself up, and I just want to thank you again. I love the work you're doing. You all are amazing. Thank you so much. Last question: Do, do African Americans feel uncomfortable sometimes talking to white people? Like white people feel uncomfortable talking about? <laughs> I want to make sure we have that clear for everybody. Oh, absolutely. We are not comfortable. And in fact, one of the things that, that we, that black people love to do is, uh, or to see is, you know, a white person will come up to you and say, I know I'm really white, so I don't understand this. I mean, so now we're talking about it and making light of it. So, you know, I'll say, okay, my black culture tells me that when I see this, this is what this means. Like, please don't make me have to tell the police that someone stole our purse. You go ahead and you talk to the police for me, you know, depending upon where we are. But I'm just saying, make light of it. Um, people are, you know, it, it's a fine line. You, you, you don't want to joke maybe too far, but, um, People are appreciative when you come to them and say, you know, me and my white world, help me with this. So, and black people will gladly sit down. We want to tell you about who we are. We've had to hide it for so long. Okay. Well, we'll end with this final comment. It's not a question. It came from our chat and it said, um, this is the most powerful conversation on race and whiteness that I have heard. Um, thanks to Mended Hearts for providing the super speaker. So thank you so much for being with us, Brenda. We so appreciate it. Um, and we will, you can feel free to stay with us, but we're probably going into some boring stuff with policies and procedures. But mm. um, we want to thank you again for, for spending an hour with us today. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon. Good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Brenda. you so much, Brenda. That was excellent. Thank you. Take care. You have been listening to Diversity Awareness Training as part of Mended Hearts and Mended Little Hearts Leadership Training 2020 by Brenda Fannin of the Heal Collaborative. You can find more information on the Heal Collaborative at healcollaborative.org. You can also look at other information and resources, including www.ibramxkendi.com for How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is a book and other resources. You can go to the National Institutes of Health website to find an article on medical apartheid. You can go to www.thecolorofcompromise.com for the book, The Color of Compromise, and other resources. You can view a TED Talk by Ruby Sales on how we can heal the pain of racial division on your YouTube channel. If you would like more information, you can also always contact the International Headquarters and Resource Center at 1-888-HEART-99 or 1-888-99. 432-7899 or info at mendedhearts.org or info at mendedlittlehearts.org.
Thank you for listening to this important topic.